Well, we have a very special treat, which is something we've never done before, but we're having an encore performance of a speaker who had such an amazing response today. We wanted to do a replay so that everybody could experience her message. So I would like to invite to the stage Monica Verma. Monica, would you please join us? <laughs> Monica's presentation this morning, a deep dive into the seismic shift in cybersecurity, was an absolute mind blower. And we had such a great response. And Monica is the uh, founder of Monica Talk Cyber and CISO at the Nor Norwegian Directorate of Health. Uh, and she is a committed and passionate security leader with 15 years of experience in information security, cyber security, emergency preparedness, and risk management. Uh, she has very strong ties to the finance and health sector, and she's a respected speaker, blogger, YouTuber, and podcaster. And I'm really proud that we get to have her, not once today, but twice, to share her knowledge, wisdom, and experience with us. Thank you very much. Welcome, give her a warm welcome, please. Wow, what an honor, right? So, good afternoon, everybody. Are we all doing great? I want to hear a big yes. yes. Awesome. So, how do we build security in a world of uncertainties but staggering opportunities? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Cybercrime is a lot like human species. Cybercrime is an evolution. And just like any human or biological evolution, cybercrime has evolved massively over the last many decades. Wouldn't you agree with me? Yeah. But what if I said maybe even last many hundred years? Would you believe me? Okay, let's find out. Does anybody here know what photos represents? Or what are these letters in French? Anybody here speaks French? Somebody said, okay. I speak no French, no talent there. So I had to type in letter by letter and Google what it said. And I'll come back to that. But before that, almost 200 years ago, in the late 1700s, we experienced what we know today as one of the world, world's first cyber attack in the history of humanity. Almost 200 years ago, in the late 1700s, in 1790s, France built one of the world's first data networks to transfer information through the company, uh, through the country, in a matter of minutes. Much faster than letters at that time. So how did this data network actually work? It actually consisted of a chain of tower Tain of towers just like this here, with wooden blocks on the top that could be adjusted and moved, and set in a particular configuration to reveal certain information. And an operator in any of these towers would basically set the configuration of the tower or the wooden blocks in the tower to match that of an adjacent tower that could only be observed through a telescope and was only reserved for government use. Through this method, they just match the configuration and the information just ripple through the towers, transferring information at that time in France in a matter of minutes, much faster than letters at that time. But then in 1800s, in 1834 precisely, two bankers, the Blanc brothers, found a way to hack the system. And social engineering, as always, was used and they managed to steal financial market information, effectively conducting world's first cyber attacks. And the letters here basically say, damn it, we have been hacked. Is that right, French guy? Yes, fantastic. <laughs> so in those last 200 years, we've obviously seen a massive evolution in the digital landscape, right? Yes. yes. So much so, that has led to convergence, instigated by uncertainties, but also staggering opportunities and risks. 
So what are some of the things that we can take from this pattern that we're seeing, or at least what we've experienced in the last and the current decade, and what can we learn to build security better going forward? 2010s was a decade of convergence. In 2010s, we saw a massive rise in convergence, especially since the Industry 4.0 revolution that started in 2011. In 2010s, we also saw one of the biggest attacks against the OT and IT convergence, the SCARA systems, which was through Stuxnet. But then what's interesting is that we also started seeing a shift towards convergence with the biological world, a shift towards convergence with human augmentation, microbiochips, and bionic devices. And this conversion with the biological world is just going to get bigger going forward. Then obviously came 2020s. We were stuck by an acceleration of uncertainties, especially because of pandemic that spread like wildfire, because of convergence, globalization, and many other reasons. Followed by a massive rise in ransomware attacks. And when I say massive, I am not exaggerating. Just in 2020, we saw an increase of more than 400% of attacks and ran just ransomware attacks. I think it was around 480%, so one can actually say nearly 500% to be more accurate. Followed by global supply chain attacks. So much so that we saw a shift from ransomware as a key attack vector to ransomware as a service. And in the next 10 years, we're going to experience an explosion of opportunities, whether it's through autonomous cars, applied artificial intelligence, inter-robotic things, augmented and virtual reality, bio-revolution, biohacking, genome editing, and we'll come to these examples, real world examples. Put simply, we believe augmented reality is going to change the way we use technology forever. We're already seeing things that will transform the way you work, Play, connect, and learn. We're already seeing quadriplegics typing only using their brain through use and evolution of brain-computer interface. We're already seeing actual <laughs> artificial intelligence tools like this from MIT that can help detect melanoma with 90% sensitivity and accuracy comparable to that of an expert dermatologist. So who knows what that is? Right, it's a 3D printed guitar, but what's so special about it? Am I going to shock the world with my amazing talent? No, got no talent there either. The thing that's amazing about this 3D printed guitar is it was used in one of the very first live concerts in the world that played only using 3D printed instruments. And where did it happen? Here in Sweden. The band members, I believe, were a student of the Lund University's Malmö Academy of Music. We're also seeing already bio-revolution, bio-hacking, or precisely genome editing. In 2020, two scientists were awarded Nobel Prize in Chemistry for developing a method for genome editing. This method basically allows scientists to remove any strand of DNA they wish. Imagine reversing aging. Imagine stopping aging. Imagine mutations in our bodies. X-Men is not going to be just a fantasy anymore. Or robotic assistance, inter-robotic devices for inpatient care, other health services, disaster recovery, COVID-19 management, and much more. Or how about this, again, artificial intelligence software that can help detect uh, breast cancer risks 30 times faster than any human, with 99% accuracy. And many more such examples that we're going to see in the next 10 years. In fact, I believe in the next 10 years, the evolution, the technology that we're going to see might be even more than what we have seen in the next 100 years. So while we're seeing the seismic shift in the technological evolution, 
we're also seeing and experiencing one more thing at the same time, which is the evolution in cybercrime. Rather, a shift towards fully fledged cybercrime as a service, which has been accelerating dramatically. And cyber criminals are sentient. Ultimately, they want profits. And just like any other business, they're driven by business goals. Have you thought of cyber criminals having business goals? Or like entrepreneurs just gone to the dark side? We don't think of them like that, right? But they actually are. So just like any legitimate business, and just like business goals in any legitimate business, they are driven by business goals. And what do you believe are the business goals of cyber criminal organizations? Very similar to that of legitimate business goals. They're also trying to hire the right resources to carry out the attack or the right customers who are going to buy it, or trying to reduce the time and cost of the attack lifecycle operation, ransom, trying to reduce their reputational damage in the dark web or other kind of reputational or risks that they have in regards to capture or seize, and whilst increasing the ROI throughout the attack lifecycle. In fact, in 2019, we lost almost, we lost $2.9 million to cybercrime per minute. In 2020, the average cost of cybercrime per organization, per minute, was approximately $24. And in 2021, the cost of cybercrime worldwide was predicted to be $11.4 million per minute, which is whooping $6 trillion annually. That's more than what the largest market cap company Apple makes in a year. It's not a very fair comparison, but just you get the idea. Perpetrators continue to be increasingly ruthless and methodical in their modi operandi. And we're seeing this more and more, especially with this example that I believe every one of you sitting here knows of, what happened in Germany. The hackers basically ransomware the hospital, causing them massive disruptions, so much so that a woman who was suffering with aortic aneurysm in the ambulance on the way to the hospital had to be sent to another hospital 32 kilometers away. She died within an hour. And legally, while the prosecutors tried and could not convict the hackers of negligent homicide because of the, the law in Germany that basically says that they needed to have enough evidence and proof that hackers had a decisive role to play, which was difficult in this case, but medically, it's highly likely that that ransomware attack costed her her life. And examples like these are just going to be more and more plausible going forward especially with the convergence with the biological world that I talked about earlier. And in just the last year, we saw a drastic rise of deepfakes, disrupting both society and businesses. So as I mentioned before, in the next 10 years, we're going to reinvent every industry on this planet, including yours, including your industry and your businesses, to whatever extent, but it's going to happen. Nobody knows the future, but it's very highly likely. So, while we're seeing this evolution in technology, this massive evolution in cybercrime, how do we go forward with cybersecurity? It's imperative that organizations plan and invest in longer lasting security measures. But what exactly is longer lasting? I don't know of anything precisely in cybersecurity that we can actually call longer lasting. <laughs> what does it actually mean? So in my experience, one of the challenges, one of the biggest challenges that we face in a cybersecurity industry is that we're always playing catch up to cyber criminals. The gap between the cybercrime evolution curve and the security curve is always there. We can try to reduce it, and we are doing a good job at that, or trying to do a good job at that, but we are not able to close it when we'll never go to zero. And the play field will never be even. So maybe, here's an idea. Maybe we need to stop playing catch up and start thinking differently. But what is exactly that differently? 
And that's the key. Just like evolution in technology, in te technology just like evolution in cybercrime, we need to think evolution-driven cybersecurity. And this is not a fad. This is not a buzzword. I will explain you exactly what it means and what does it entail. And it's actually very simple. So what is one of the key principles of evolution? It's survival of the fittest. But what does that mean? It's not about smartness. It's not about strength. It's not about intelligence. It's not about your IQ. It's about one key thing, and that's adaptability to change. That's what survival of fitness is primarily about. So when we talk about evolution-driven cybersecurity, we need to simply think evolution through adaptability. That's literally it, which I call adaptive security. This is a term that I coined in 2020 and was part of my earlier models, which is cybersecurity adoption lifecycle model, which you can find on dark reading or my website or any of the newspapers um, if you just Google for it. But what I wanted to talk about today is practical characteristics of adaptive security and how you can build it in your organization. So first, you need to understand maturity and resilience are not the same thing. While you might have linear progression in maturity and go step one, step two, step three, and linearly progress, resilience might not be linear. It takes much more to get better resilience over time. So before we get to adaptive security, it's not that we have to do these steps only when we're fully done, but there is a sense of these steps, and I'll come to that to understand what this basically entails in terms of investment and in terms of what you get out of it. So we all know of this and sometimes even dread of this regulatory-driven cybersecurity, right? Compliance base, check boxes, regulatory frameworks, audit requirements could be actually good, could actually provide some level of security if especially the regulatory frameworks are per industry, type of data that you're processing, good, fantastic, okay. Good to start, but just let's not stop there, okay? Then, this is something that we're doing today. Most of the talks that we are doing, most of the work that we're doing, it's risk-driven cybersecurity, right? Known risks, known vulnerabilities, risk and vulnerability management, making sure that the risks and the incidents have a feedback loop, and most importantly, looking at a holistic picture and implementation from risk to incidents to recovery. Great, fantastic. This next step is something that I've implemented in many organizations. It's not that hard. I don't see many organizations do it, but a lot more are actually doing it. But I absolutely recommend that you go back today or tomorrow, whenever you are in the organization, and think about that from day one, because it's going to give you massive returns and not that difficult. It's threat-driven cybersecurity. Just ensure that you're taking threat model, threat actors, threat motivation, and threat capabilities into account in your risk management. And this will most likely affect the probability side of it. This will also help you have investments in security that are not just risk-based, but also threat-based, and public-private partnerships. Great. Fantastic. Now we come to evolution-driven. OK, ooh, evolution-driven. How do we build that? OK. Before I explain it to you, I'm going to ask you all of you three questions, OK? And just raise your hands. Question number one. How many of you know, I know you know it, but how many of you know that you have been breached in the last 12 months? Oh, no, it was actually longer than 12 months, but yeah, last 12 months. Okay, few hands, great, fantastic. How many of you think that you might have been breached in the last 12 months just to know about it? Come on, okay, half the room, half of them is lying, but okay, good. I'm not really sure, but okay. Third question, how many of you believe that there's a high likelihood or chance that you might be breached in the next 12 months? Okay, I want to see all the hands raised up. Okay, majority of them are fantastic, amazing. So what's the pattern here? The pattern is that we can't really control, and we know there's a high likelihood that we were breached yesterday, are under attack today, or going to be breached tomorrow, right? So assume breach is obviously important. But what we can control, or at least impact much better, is loss. 
either reduction of loss, minimization of loss, or maybe even avoidance of loss, depending on how we actually put in the controls. And here's where the adaptive security comes in place. So in one of my previous roles as a CISO in the finance sector, as you mentioned, I have strong ties to finance and health. Um, we once got breached. Oh, oh, let me rephrase. We once found out that we got breached, to be very precise. And one of the things that we did and that I'm really proud of with my team was that we put in certain security controls in an emergency mode that, that you know you have to obviously do when you are in this crisis situation. But these controls were basically for putting in effect which usually would not be there in business as usual. So, for example, segregating certain services that don't need to be segregated or segmented, segmented in a business as usual scenario because they're not critical services, they belong in the same segment, but just do that because you can prevent lateral movement right in the time and actually avoid a bigger loss that can happen later. And that's precisely it. It's the characteristics that make it adaptive security. It's not about stopping. It's not even about recovery. It's about how do you adapt, what controls do you put in place in different scenarios, not just business needs, but scenarios. So number one is selective for different business scenarios. The second is, again, as I mentioned, adaptive capabilities. Because you don't know what you will need when you're in an attack scenario or in an uncrisis scenario. You just don't know that. So we might be able to manage risks which are known. We are able to manage vulnerabilities which are known. And I'm not talking about zero day, but what about crisis, which is not known and can happen. Much higher chances than zero day vulnerabilities, basically. And this cannot happen if you don't have continuous visibility throughout your supply chain and ongoing monitoring. But that's not an excuse for you to go back home and then go to your offices and start surveillance. That's not ongoing monitoring, okay? Don't use it as an excuse that Monica said it so we can do it. No, please don't do that. So, to sum it up, the acceleration rate of both technological and cybercrime evolution is accelerating. Let me say that again. The acceleration rate itself of both technological and cybercrime evolution is accelerating. And this gap between this evolution curve and cybersecurity curve is going to be there. Even if you reduce it, the play field will never be even. So maybe we need to stop playing catch up. But there is good news. And the good news is we can absolutely build better security a missed convergence, a missed uncertainties, and a miss, a miss staggering opportunities and risks if we think and build evolution-driven cybersecurity or adaptive security. Thank you.